Remember earlier in the show this morning, I gave you the latest statistics from the Ministry of Health um, on COVID and uh, how they're reporting, for example, that a total of 3,807 New Zealanders have either died of or with COVID uh, since it was identified, what, three years ago uh, for the virus uh, and the virulent virus that it was. How we reacted to COVID, uh, well, will partially be dealt with, but um, nevertheless, we know that in part one of the reasons, and maybe the better part of one of the reasons why the government of the day effectively closed New Zealand down was because it believed that our health system could not cope um, uh, with um, the massive number of people who might be calling upon it. But in an article um, just published recently by the Dean of Otago University's Med School and the Pro Vice Chancellor of Otago University, uh, Professor Robin Gould, um, he makes the point uh, that our health system was struggling for a long, long, long time uh, before COVID arrived on our shores in 2021 and that every day, every month, for years now, we have been regaled with its failures and with the human tragedies and miseries that have been caused by it. Uh, Joining us to talk about this and to think at least about what a future might look like uh, now that district health boards have been disestablished, um, which were a failure of their own, but I can only tell you that from personal experience, um, and what a future might look like in a country that is not rich. Um, Professor Gord joins us. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for doing so. And um, did I get that right? You are the pro vice chancellor of Otago University as well. Oh, um, uh, Moreno, uh, thanks very much, Michael. Thanks for having me on this morning. Uh, so I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Commerce and Dean of the Otago Business School. Ah, right. Okay. So you don't have a medical background per se? No, I don't. But I did work at the Otago Medical School for uh, 20 years, actually. Um, I was head of the Department of Preventive and Social Medicine for a little short of two years before in 2016 going over to be in charge of the business school. Oh, I see. I'm, uh, right. short, I'm very shortly finishing up in that role and um, returning to a, a new role, uh, very innovative for Otago, which is joint between the business and the medical school working on the business of health. What will that entail? Because the business of health sort of sends alarm bells, I think, through people like me. I'm assuming that you yeah. don't want to send an alarm bell through me. No, look, I mean... You know, having spent time in a business school training students, I mean, our, our focus is on skilling, skilling people of all ages uh, with tools so that they can go out and improve organisations that they work with and be they uh, community-based organisations, the government uh, or the private sector or starting their own business. So uh, when I talk about the business of health, it's really about you know, the, the tools for improving organising, leading uh, the healthcare system. You could use other terms to describe it, but... Uh, business of health, I, I sort of think, has got a, a reasonable ring to it. Uh, and, you know, because a lot of it is uh, funding that goes into equipment, to staffing, to facilities, you know, hospital builds, as we have uh, going on in the south at the moment. There's a, there's a huge amount of um, uh, that sort of skill set that is actually really important in healthcare, and we just don't take it seriously enough. No, fair enough. Um, it's just that um, I'm aware... Having served on a district health board for three terms, Robin, that it always seemed to me that the health bureaucrats were a part of the problem, and then they were duplicated times twenty throughout the district health boards, each with their own management structure. And to be honest with you, not a lot of clinical awareness. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that. Um, yeah, I was not a great fan of the district health boards. In fact, I think I, I wrote. Uh, prior to them being set up when the legislation was going through, I wrote a book sort of speculating about the, and the last chapter speculating about the DHBs and I sort of pointed out a whole range of areas where I thought there were going to be, you know, quite significant challenges and it's turned out to have been 
uh, been through, really, unfortunately. Oh, they were, um, they were a disaster, mate. They were they were a disaster, yeah. and I was in them. So you know, you could yeah. just you yeah, could just see right. it evolve, and you couldn't do anything about it either because it was also been there was there was this unnatural relationship between health bureaucrats in Wellington, and between health bureaucrats and the DHBs, and. Uh, between the two of them, they were more consumed with the business side, as I said, than necessarily getting the clinical outcomes. Which mm. I, I think I, is... I think the, uh, yeah, sorry, carry on. Oh, I was just going to say, I think the DHB system was set up, and this is, I think what I, I had to go back and check what I was writing in 2020. Oh, sorry, 20, 2000, the year 2000, 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Um, was that the DHBs <laughs> were set up so that um, the centre could um, uh, claim success when success uh, occurred, and then put blame out to the DHBs when blame was to be put somewhere. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, you're right about that. Um, it was also a great way of depoliticising. So was, I always saw the DHBs, um, to, 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 to buttress just what you've said, as a way for the locally um, elected, who had no say at all, them to take the blame rather than the Minister of Health when they cut services yes. as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, um, now... COVID made things worse, though. We are discovering now that our response to COVID, when we thought was so clever, has in actual fact exacerbated uh, many of the difficulties in the health system. And um, throughout the Western world, one of them was stopping people getting access to health services during that period of time, which, of course, has had for many people disastrous consequences. I think our waiting list now is longer than it's been. Is it in the history of New Zealand? Robin? Uh, uh, it, quite, quite probably so, actually. Yeah, quite probably so. I'd have to go back um, further into history, but I, I strongly suspect it's the worst it's, it's ever been now. All right. Thinking forward, we've now got a two health organisations, um, one Māori, one not, um, and that's the question we have when we're talking with you. You are arguing for reforms of the health system. They need to be big, and they need to be long-term to be effective, where would you start? Uh, look, I, I think, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a supporter of the current directions. Um, I mean, I think the, the structures that are being put in place are good. Um, they're moving in the right direction. The, the issues that are of great concern to me are that um, the way in which we fund healthcare in New Zealand uh, is setting the new system up really to probably not achieve what its um, goals are, which are to um, you know, eradicate the variations up and down the country in terms of access, you know, to get more sort of national consistency in terms of how we, how we deliver and open up access to care you know, for, the, for those most in need uh, and then also to uh, improve equity of access um, I, I just don't think the reforms are going to deliver on those goals, which are really important, um, really, really important goals for all of us and all of the different populations in the country who have varying access and varying health outcomes, you know, the difference in life expectancy between different groups, Māori and uh, Pacific and you know, people of lower socioeconomic status and others. The, the issue to me is that we're continuing to um, you know, fund health care through the tax system which just sort of pushes money out into the health system, which has then been spent. Um, the issue to me is that we, we need to try and open up the resources of the entire healthcare system, so that's public and private. Um, you know, what, what, what we all know is that if you can pay, and people do stay quiet about this, because um, you, know, you, you start to disrupt it and you're losing access to a lot of people who can pay and benefit quite well out of the private, private system. Um, uh, you know, those who pay will, will go private. Um, it costs a lot, costs a heck of a lot to get private treatment. Uh, the private system um, uh, work, works in an uncomfortable uh, coexistence with the public system. I mean, most of the specialists have a public uh, role as well as their private role. Um, the public sector buys quite a lot of um, service from the private sector on a sort of a um, contract per contract basis and different kinds of arrangements. We have ACC that uses the private sector quite a lot. They're a different organisation, of course. So I, I think it's time that we had a good conversation uh, around um, a social insurance 
uh, type funding arrangement, which is more like ACT. And you'll find this in Germany, um, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, um, and other parts of the world have so, social so, insurance. So, okay, so just to get this right. I pay my taxes to get a public health system here, and as you say, the service is pretty spotty. Uh, 1.2 million New Zealanders, I think, are estimated to have private health insurance in this country. Um, but so, if I want to get something quickly done, um, I might go and get it in the private health sector. But you're saying there needs to be a separate payment, a social security payment, are you on top of that, so that everybody can have the same access to health services as I get in the private system. Is that right? Um, n not, not, not fully. Um, so, so social insurance is a different funding model. So what, what you would be doing is um, stopping paying direct taxes for health care, which at the moment Cabinet just takes, you know, what is it, 20% of the government budget and gives it to <coughs> health care. Um, so it, you, you may lower your general taxes, uh, and then you would have in place an ACC type system where employers and employees are going to pay into a um, health social insurance uh, scheme. The government probably would uh, pay into that as well as they do in most, most parts of the world that have social insurance. That would be to ensure that those who are unable to um, um, contribute enough were um, uh, being covered for um, and to ensure that certain goals are going to be met. Uh, and then the social insurance fund basically pays out to the provider of healthcare. So it's agnostic of provider, and this to me is a really important point. It's agnostic of who provides the care. So it doesn't care about whether it's public or private, because I don't think you can unlock the mm. arrangements we have in place at the moment, the public and the private. I mean, it's, these are really embedded arrangements. Um, uh, you, you know, you just can't nationalise the private sector. It just would be inappropriate and, um, and far too difficult and not achieve the goals that you uh, set out to achieve. So, but, so with social insurance, it's just paying out. Pub public or private, it doesn't care. So it's doing hips and knee joints to whoever provides them, you know, cataracts, whoever will provide them. We need these cataracts done. Um, and the one really, really important, uh, important point about social insurance, and if you go to Germany, for example, which has had this model for you know, 175 years or something. Um, uh, for them, what's really important is solidarity. You know, it's the equity um, uh, dimension of social insurance that's really, really critical. It doesn't matter who you are, you know, how wealthy you are or how poor you are, you get exactly the same coverage by the social insurance uh, funding scheme. I guess, so though... It, it but, solves but, the equity problem. So it, it might solve the equity problem, but then I can see what the political pushback might be, and you can see it as well, obviously, too. That means that I, somebody will be determining where I list, am on that scheme. Let's just say it is a knee replacement. So there'll be, it'll be based, graded upon need, uh, as I understand it, and then there'll still be a cut-off point. If I've got money... Um, and I'm below that cutoff point. You don't want me to get access to the health service. Well, there shouldn't be a cutoff point. I mean, basically, social insurance, in theory, uh, and this should be the case for our healthcare system. In any case, we'll meet we'll be all dealing needs. with clinically assessed needs. Yeah, we have a lot of un unmet need in this country. Uh, in fact, I was involved in a paper published last week in the New Zealand Medical Journal. Again. Um, Plea, uh, you know, making a plea for measuring unmet secondary elective healthcare need, which we don't do in this country. So that waiting list figure that's come out that I've um, stated in that paper that's come out today uh, in the conversation yesterday, um, that, that's just the people who've been assessed um, and are sitting on a waiting list. It's, yeah. not dealing, it's, it's not counting the people who have unmet uh, elective healthcare needs that aren't being assessed. Now, I think we all think the Germans are pretty efficient people, but we're also aware of the fact that they have a pretty dynamic economy. Um, and uh, they have, what, 60, oh God, over 60 million um, people mm. there um, to fund it, uh, most of whom are working and literate um, and, and skilled. Does the New Zealand economy have the same ability, given the makeup and composition of it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a good question. I mean, I think... You know, ACC has done a reasonable job over the years of providing accident and uh, injury coverage. Um, 
Uh, we know uh, from studies of people with, um, say, who are victims of a stroke, uh, compared with people who are victims of a spinal injury, uh, and so the, the latter is covered by ACC, the former is the public health care mm. system, mm. the people covered by ACC have much better access to care and uh, much better recovery and long-term outcomes. They do, yeah. So you know, ACC is doing something right, yeah. uh, and if we get that kind of system in place in the public sector and open up, open up all of the resources in the country... Um, and, you know, probably, uh, I hate to use the word, but, you know, get a bit of competition happening between the public and the private sector as well, uh, because your income will be generated through treating patients uh, who are funded by social insurance, which would be everyone. Yeah. Because social insurance is universal and covers the entire population. No, I like the idea. Can I just give you a personal um, experience of ACC? I'm a runner. Um, yes. I, d I did my right knee. Um Within three months, I'd been assessed, flown to Christchurch, been operated on, and was recovered um, under ACC. And I got ACC because it was a running injury. Um, try try get the same in a public sector if it wasn't a running injury. That's absolutely right. And, I mean, and the thing with ACC is that they don't want you back. They, they want to see you, treat you, uh, put you through rehabilitation and get you productively back to work Yeah. because otherwise you become an additional cost to them. So they have that incentive, uh, which is, I, I think, really important. Mm, I like your model. Um, well, I'm starting to like it now. Okay. And, and frankly, this is the sort of ideas that should be coming from academia in New Zealand, um, something that's practical, innovative, et cetera, and you've got international comparisons. Where do you see your major <laughs> where do you see your major impediments coming from for that kind of health system from just about everybody in the health sector who's got a financial stake yeah yep yeah. well you know those providing care and um you know you think about the public and the private sector i mean i don't think there's going to be any shortage of work for them um you know it may just set up a bit more uh competition in terms of ensuring that you're going to uh, get the income that is going to sustain you. And if you look at if you look at the countries that have social insurance, the public hospitals tend to have large outpatient clinics because they want to treat and they almost turn into general practices because they want to be seeing patients in the community. It's a way of generating income for them. So one has to be very very careful in terms of how they design the system. And I think with some good deep thinking, we could design quite a good variation of social uh, insurance in New Zealand to try and take out some of the uh, some of the less desirable behaviours within the system that, that might occur. I, th I think, coming back to your question, the biggest barriers probably are, you know, this is quite a jump. It's a massive jump from flushing taxpayer funding out into the system and hoping for the best um, to setting up a different funding pathway. Uh, it's quite a jump. It would require a big conversation. Um, then... Uh, you would need a significant amount of funding to, to start the social insurance fund up uh, as you shift away from your sort of your taxpayer funding and into employer and employee contributions going into the fund. Um, so yeah, there'd be a lot of work and, you know, politically it would be a, a really large step. But, I mean, I, I think we need, you know, we need some really visionary and deep thinking about how we are going to uh, fund healthcare into the future in, in New Zealand. We just we just have not been successful over the years. Um, you know, we're always just a bit too far behind. We're always just a bit underinvested, uh, and we see this. And I know that um, Te Fatu Order and Te Aka Pai Order, the two new organisations, and you know the boards that oversee them. I know that uh, you know people who are sitting on those boards who are new to this are just saying they uh, they can't believe the underinvestment in the health sector over the years and everything from workforce through to facilities. And there's a massive catch-up game going on. And that catch-up game has also been going on for years. So we, we need to just think differently and, and deeply about it, in, in my view. Um, it, it strikes me that in my time in public life, so I first entered Parliament as a researcher for the opposition, national opposition, in 1985. So that's almost 40 years now, 38 years ago. Health has been on the agenda for as long as I've been in public life. Um, and the government has, of the days, 
National Labor, whatever, have gone through a variety of um, what you could only say reform mechanisms. And yet, here we are in 2023, Robin, and if anything, things are worse now than better. Is that also, though, because there is a greater expectation in our community than 40 years ago as to what the health system will do for us? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, healthcare needs are um, ever increasing. Um, you know, the ability to treat and diagnose uh, is much, much uh, broader than it was 40 years ago. Um, people are living longer, um, and we know that the longer you live, um, the more um, healthcare conditions one uh, uh, suffers. And, um, and so we use this term multi morbidity which describes patients who have multiple sort of complex uh, healthcare needs. Um, and so, you know, it's, a, uh, it's an ever-continuing um, ever, ever sort of increase in demand that's going on to the healthcare system. Um, but it seems intractable. Uh, and, and that's why I'm just asking you at the end of it. I understand you at this model. I can see the benefits to it. I understand um, certainly well uh, the political. Um, it won't be a furore, but you know you'd have to push it through and and be and, and 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 push it through politically, obviously against some vested interest groups. But I guess the question, Robin, and you've been around long enough too, is: Are we rich enough to be able to fund the health needs of this country? Um, because it doesn't seem, from again, from the outside, that we are as rich as the Germanys, the Australias, the Canadas, the countries that we compete against in many ways for those um, highly skilled clinical staff. What do you think? Yeah, uh, yeah pr probably not. Um, and, you know, it, it's difficult globally. Um, you know, Australia is an extremely... Uh, attractive place for a healthcare professional to go and work in, you know, if they like big cities, that is, um, and mosquitoes and spiders and so forth, they'll get paid more, their terms and conditions may be better. So, you know, we have this, um, you know, constant sort of brain drain, I guess, to Australia of, of health professionals. Uh, that's something that we just can't compete with because uh, they, they pay more. Um, in, in terms of our wealth, uh, I mean, I think that's a really important question. But, you know, there are other things that we can be doing that we haven't been doing. And, um, you know, one of them is really investing in um, what's, what's called in, uh, uh, in the industry um, operational excellence, which is um, a term that describes basically um, involving your healthcare professionals, your frontline staff, in systematically improving the environment within which they work. And management, the job of management, so this is basic quality improvement, uh, is another term to use for it. Um, total quality uh, improvement, um, uh, it's called. Um, it, it, and management's job is to support the front line and ensure that they act on identified obstacles to providing really good care. Um, yeah, we do this in a, we've, we've done quite a lot of this around the country. It's mostly been done in a sort of a piecemeal fashion and you know, probably of late, there's been little uh, ability to really focus on um, operational excellence across the system. And I think with Te Whatu Order now, you know, with the Health NZ structures being put in place, we've got an opportunity to really pull down and focus on operational excellence. Organisations, if you look around the world, you know, hospitals, public and private, that have focused on operational excellence, you know, strong clinical input into how care is organised and delivered, uh, tend to perform much better than those that, that don't. Um, and finally, you are resident in an area where you are going to get a massive new building. Uh, it's going to cost over $1 billion, and there are enormous scraps about, as already, the kind of services that will be provided in that building, uh, from beds through to staff. Um, uh, it strikes me and I'm just interested from you from a commercial perspective that the billion plus that we're going to be putting into building a building um, and the services in it um, seems an inordinate waste of money when really you're trying to deliver 
um, the services and operations um, to the people that you're talking about. What's your view on that? The amount of money we spend on infrastructure compared to services. Yeah, I mean the the, the infrastructure is really important, um, and you know if you talk to um, clinical staff, uh, you know certainly here at Canadian Public Hospital, uh, they will say that it's actually because of the um, design of the building, the current clinical services building, it's often quite difficult for them to um, effectively treat patients. Um, and so the design is really important. You know, the facilities here are outmo outmoded. They, they come from a different era. Um, so having good facilities is really important. It, it does improve efficiency um, and it does enable you to you know, put in place the, uh, the infrastructure that you need for the future. I mean, I guess my worry with the, um, the Dunedin Public Hospital build uh, is, um, I mean, I, I haven't seen what does the hospital of the future look like you know, in global terms. Mm. You know, who's, who's doing the deep, uh, who, who's doing the serious thinking about the hospital of the future? Because the future for healthcare is very, 50 years from now, very different from what it is today. Um, you know, there are all sorts of predictions that um, many of the diseases that we are currently beset with will basically be eradicated. Uh, and that will be through new therapies, um, you know, genetic therapies and so forth that basically stem a, stem a disease before it even occurred. Um, so we need to be thinking really hard about what the hospital of the future looks like. It's probably still going to require that billion plus investment, which is an extraordinary amount of money, really. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, and, and then, of course, it's the links with the community. Um, you know, future healthcare is um, ideally community-based uh, and home, even home-based mm. uh, through virtual and other other delivery mechanisms. Um, so that, that's, I guess, for me, a question which I haven't really seen answered. Uh, but I, I agree, I and mean, there's a lot of noise about it and deep concern that the hospital still is not going to be uh, fit for purpose by the time it's built. Mm, uh, I, I just it, it, it's just that I watch the private sector build hospitals really quick um, and deliver services in them including things like uh, CAT scans and the like and then I see this huge building going up and the sort of argument about well there's the services there it's going to take years decade I understand um, and then be inadequate for the purpose when it's finally completed does seem a slight waste of money to me yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's astonishing that it's taken so long. Um, I agree. I mean, you you can build things quickly if you if you have a will. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I, I I can I just say a compliment you on this is what academia is for, Professor. This is what we like to hear: ideas being challenged, new concepts being uh, formulated, solutions to problems that exist. Um, being floated. Um, so all power to you and um, I hope some of your ideas get taken up in the future. No, thanks very much, Michael. I've, I've enjoyed the conversation today, so thanks for having me on. And um, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. That's our job is to be the critic and conscience of society and you know raise discussion points. So thanks for the opportunity. No, thank you. Have a good day. All right, that's Professor Robin Gould. He's... Um, well, as you know, he's the Pro Vice Chancellor at Otago University. But our health system is an absolute mess. And you know if you've tried to access the public health system. I actually had a relative of mine um, had a fall, a 90-year-old woman, uh, waiting in a hospital in Dunedin. And can also say the COVID protocols aren't making things better in those hospitals. There is this fear of COVID that, frankly, ah, has, has, has now made it crazy when you go into a public hospital and you're waiting for somebody to be treated at emergency departments or something like that. Um, uh, no, it's a... Uh, yeah. It, we certainly need a revolutionary change and we don't have it at the moment.